Welcome everybody. We're just gonna leave, we've just opened the door to the webinar. So we're just gonna leave that open for a while and let everybody come in. Great. Do another minute or two. We started right, right at 6.30. So um, I'm sure there'll be a few people who join us um, in a few minutes. Um, and as folks come in, so I just wanna point out a couple of things. Um, this is in webinar format, just as it was last night. Um, it is being recorded. So if you miss anything or if you have to leave early, um, this will be available to view to, for everybody throughout the whole um, surveying season. And then also, I want to let you know that we have two options to talk. So we have the chat, which is down at the bottom. Um, I've heard from a couple people that they weren't able to see the um, chat at all. And it looks like um, it's going to default to going to just the hosts and panelists. So hopefully you see a drop down menu there. And if you hit that, there is a button that says everyone. You can change it so everyone can see um, your chat. And I'm, I'm hoping everybody can see that. So if you do have anything um, that you wanna say to everybody, you are welcome to, to do that. Um, throughout the presentation tonight, if you have any questions, please, please. Um, and I'm looks like, um, so uh, Sally Stockwell is here and it looks like a couple of people are saying that there is no drop down and you can only um, talk to hosts and panelists. So I apologize for that. I've um, tried to look through the settings of Zoom and I can't find anywhere where it says change that. If you, you know what, one, two, three, there we go. Um, if somebody could let me know right now if it says everyone in your drop down menu. Yes, all right, perfect. My apologies for that. So you should be able to chat with everyone now there. So if you have anything you um, would like to put in the chat, please feel free to do that. Um, if you have any questions that are related to the program or to um, the, and I'm just getting a message that people can't hear me. Can people hear me? Yes, okay, great. Um, <laughs> great. <laughs> Always fun to, you know, to start Zoom. You never know what's going to happen. Um, so if you have a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A. Um, if it is a question that is pertinent to the topic that Tom is talking about right then, I will go ahead and interrupt him um, when we can get that answered. If it's something that can wait a little bit, we will take pauses, a couple pauses throughout the presentation um, to address those questions. You are welcome to also ask questions if you have anything about um, you know, the logistics or things like that. Um, remember last night's presentation will also be available to view if you need to see that again. And then um, we will be available throughout the season um, with any questions or anything like that. So we have a lot of critters to learn about. Um, so I am going to pass this over to Tom who is gonna teach us about what we are looking for. I'm just uh, going to ch share my screen, but there's giving me a different thing here. Does it look good? Perfect. We can see All it. Right. Yes. Well, welcome everybody to day two of the Mainstream Explorers webinar. And uh, just a reminder to folks that uh, later there are a series of in-person uh, opportunities where you could go in person to see actual bugs. Uh, some of them, uh, those workshops will be situated next to stream. So you'll get to practice uh, collecting the, the critters. And I highly recommend that because, and uh, so, between now and then, you could look at the uh, guides, which will be uh, put up onto the main Audubon uh, website. 
and uh, bring the, the guides to that training workshop. And uh, it's really a great experience to learn how to you know, do the sample collections, to sort through the critters, and uh, practice using the, the key and having folks help uh, answer questions. All right, so last night uh, we talked about some of the instructional materials and how to collect samples and um, a little bit about how to sort the macroinvertebrates. And then tonight we'll really focus on an overview of the uh, different kinds of macroinvertebrates you'll find in Maine. And so uh, we have uh, uh, the guides have changed since last year. Uh, we've split the guide into three volumes. Uh, volume one, it gets into the introduction and uh, sampling instructions. Volume two, it has the basic macroinvertebrate guide. And then volume three is the expanded macroinvertebrate guide. Oh, geez. Wouldn't you know it? Push the wrong button, have to start over. Good thing it's being recorded. Okay, so uh, the basic guide uh, is the one we're kind of going to go over tonight. And in there, there's a key, and it uh, will you, you start at the top, and it mentions whether the critter has segmented legs or not. And so if it has segmented legs, it would go over to this, this, this way. And then you would have one or more choices for at each tier lower from there. And um, I won't go through all of the key today, uh, but we'll be going over uh, an overview of the critters. So I'll let people practice using the key on their own. Um, but so this uh, key here gets has all the critters with the segmented legs. So like this uh, beetle larvae here, you can see has legs on it, and you can see some segmented legs there on a caddisfly. And uh, all the second page are critters that do not have segmented legs. They may have some sort of uh, like bait legs called uh, pro legs, um, and they might have some other gills or projections on them, but they don't have jointed six jointed legs. And uh, in the guide, uh, this is an example from the advanced guide, but the, the, each of the critters will have a description uh, saying whether it's sensitive, moderately sensitive or tolerant, have some examples of pictures of what you might see in main streams that would fit in that group as a diagnostic characteristics, a little bit about their behavior, environmental sensitivity, and these scale bars that show kind of the general size of the critter that you'd be looking for in the trace that you, uh, with the samples. And we have the data sheets. Uh, so if you choose to do the paper data sheet, uh, they have on the front of the basic field data sheet, there's uh, sensitive groups of mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, and then uh, another type of caddisfly called a free-living caddisfly and water snipefly. And um, on the back, there's some other net spinning caddisflies, dragonflies, and so forth. And then if you were going to use the advanced key, the expanded key, then it, you're looking at all different kinds of mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies and so forth. So uh, for some folks, starting with the, uh, we recommend starting with the basic key. And then as you become more comfortable, then you can challenge yourself to learn more of the expanded key. And uh, then some folks may already have some knowledge or, or past experience, and they might be able to just jump right into the expanded key. But first, let's just go over an overview of what aquatic macroinvertebrates are. So there are animals without backbones that can, that can be seen without assistance of magnification. And these um, most of the aquatic macroinvertebrates you're going to find are 
aquatic insects and the, the larval forms in particular. And then you can other, have other macroinvertebrates such as worms and leeches and crayfish and snails. And the main Department of Environmental Protection has been doing uh, um, surveys of streams and rivers since 1983. And we've identified over 1,400 different kinds of macroinvertebrates in mainstream and rivers. So it's a diverse group of organisms. And uh, so I went through a process of finding the ones that were most common in main streams and provided the, the best indication of sensitive, moderately sensitive or tolerant and combined them into the Stream Explorers program. So in general, there are four types of aquatic insects and the keys are not just based on these, but knowing uh, these four types will really help kind of recognize what uh, type of insect you might have and a little bit about their life history. And it's, it, it can help in many ways. So we'll just start with these four groups. And so, the first group are insects that have jointed legs and uh, wing pads on their back, and they'll have some kind of tail filament sometimes. And the second group are ones that do not have wing pads, and they look more like a, a grub or caterpillar in shape, where they're a, like a fleshy body. And the uh, they have a distinct head, they have uh, segmented legs, but no wing pads. And then uh, we have a third group that have uh, no legs and no wing pads, but they might have these uh, pro legs that are, they're not segmented legs, but they're more like little bumps. And then the final group are adult insects or macroinvertebrates. So we'll start with the ones that are in group one. So again, group one, these have uh, ling, have legs, jointed legs. And uh, when they, all the jointed legs typically have three parts. They'll have a, a, a upper part, a middle part, and a lower part. And then the lower part will end in one or two little claws usually. And uh, they have, these group have little wing pads that will develop on the older uh, larvae. Tom, can I interrupt you just for a second? Yes. Um, we just um, we have a question. If you could just explain what wing pads are. Uh, uh, we'll get there. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so these uh, group one insects have a, what's called incomplete metamorphosis. So evolutionary wise, these are very ancient um, insects. And so they ha have a life cycle where you have an adult like this dragonfly, this green darner and they lay eggs and an egg hatches and, and then you have a larvae and, and the uh, macroinvertebrates in this group, insects in this group, the larvae is specifically called a naiad because it, it, it's, um, it's because it has the wing pads. And I'll, I'll have an example in a sec. And then uh, the larvae uh, will then uh, when, as they get older, will crawl out of the water and they'll mold their skin and they'll pump up their wings and they'll become adults. And so these larvae, when they come out of the egg, start off very teeny tiny. And uh, this is obviously not to scale, but, uh, but and they will, they'll have what are, uh, these phases where they'll grow and then molt and then grow and molt. And it's uh, similar to a lobster, where you have the lobsters will have a soft shell phase and they'll molt, and they, they'll every, every molt they'll they'll get bigger, and so the same thing with the insects. And so typically the macroinvert the insects in the, this group will have like seven to nine, maybe a little more instars, and as they're when they're very small, they uh, they, they're just growing. And then as they get older, they uh, on their uh, the back of their, their thorax, so you have a head, a thorax where the legs are, 
and then the abdomen. And on, on the middle section, the thorax, where the legs are, they'll start developing these little wing pads. And uh, I'll have a picture in a sec that might show them a little better. But you can see uh, right here on this one here, there's a this uh, brownish um, wing pad. And so in, that's where the, the new wing is developing and growing inside of that. And you won't see them on the, the young ones, but as they, they get to these older instars, they'll start developing those wing pads. And uh, so when they uh, come out of the water, they'll crawl up onto a dock or a rock or a plant, and they'll molt their exoskeleton one last time, and they'll, they'll come out and then they'll have their wings will be very small and compacted and they'll sit there for a while, might take you know an hour or more for them to uh, pump fluid from their body to into the, the, the wings and the wings will then uh, grow and then harden. And so here is a uh, dragonfly where the wings have um, reached their full growth potential and they're, they're hardening and they're, they're almost ready to fly. And I'm looking for, so he, this one on the bottom here, uh, I don't know if folks can see this brown projection here is the wing pad. And uh, here's one here. And uh, here's some on this guy here. And so um, some of them, the insects in this group one are dragonflies. Dragonflies are ancient. They were, they were around way before dragon, uh, way before dinosaurs. And they have um, the types you're going to find in main streams are most likely to be these here, some of these groups. And some of them, like the uh, club tails and spike tails, are well, you'll most likely find them where there's a little bit of sand. So you might find them in areas where you have rocks with uh, sand around the rocks, or if the sand, or if the bottom of the stream is just sandy. And so these guys will burrow in the sand and will wait for something tasty to come by, and then they'll they'll um, they have this mouth part that they extend out, like the movie Alien, and so it will snap out, grab something, and then eat it. And um, so this dragon hunter here. It is very well camouflaged. Sometimes it will look like a leaf when it's in the bottom of the pan. And they can get quite large, like it's size of a half dollar or even a dollar coin. And uh, the, they're called dragon hunters because as an adult, they uh, are very large dragonflies that are known to actually eat um, anything, including other dragonflies. And so they're pretty badass. And um, the darners, uh, are another one that you can find in fast flowing rocky streams. This one is, uh, a, this one here is the greenish one is most often found in like a, in areas of the stream where you might have leaves or roots. The ones you find in the fast flowing stream part section of a rocky stream would be uh, small and brown. Um, any case, but these are, are dragonflies and they grow up to be uh, you all know the flying dragonflies. So all dragonflies uh, start their life in water in a, a pond or a stream or lake or wetland or vernal pool, and depending on what type of species they are. And some of them will, will be in the water for the summer um, and will come out the following year um, as an adult. And then uh, some will stay in the water for multiple years before coming out. So if you find dragonflies, it's a good sign of stream health in general, because it means that they, uh, they're predators. So it means that there's a, a diversity of food in the stream and also that the water quality is good enough for a year or more for them to uh, complete their life cycle in the water. So related to uh, dragonflies are these um, insects called damselflies. 
And for folks who canoe and kayak, you might recognize these. And they can come in a, ver a whole variety of beautiful colors. And they generally, uh, they're very closely related to dragonflies. They have this uh, mouth part. Um, it's a hinged mouth part. And you can kind of see that it starts here, comes back, there's a hinge, and it comes forward again. And so it, when they want to eat something, they'll extend that mouth part out, grab a prey item, and then bring it back to eat. Um, can you all see my cursor when I'm talking? Yes, we can. Excellent. All right. And um, this one here, you can clearly see these wing pads hanging on the back here. So this is an older larvae. If it was a younger lar larva, it might not have the, uh, the wing pads. And I use the term larva, but um, the larva in this group also are called naiads. And so the keeper damselflies, it, uh, again, you have these jointed legs and wing pads. And um, I should have mentioned that the damsel, the dragonflies, uh, they don't have any observable gills. So uh, the, all of these critters have to breathe and get oxygen in some way. And so uh, dragonflies have gills inside their body. So they'll suck in water, run the water over their gills, and it shoot it out their rear end. And um, if you're working with kids, it, you can actually uh, poke a dragonfly a little bit and it will suck water in its mouth and shoot the water out its rear end and it's like jet propulsion and so the kids can find that fun and you, you call it fart propulsion, fart propulsion and the kids laugh and it's, it's, it's a great icebreaker. And uh, damselflies in contrast have external gills so these, these tails here are shaped like leaves uh, or like a canoe paddle they're very flat. So if you're looking at them from above, they would look very thin. But if you look at them from the side, they're these leaf paddle shape. And they have three gills. And um, they have an elongate body compared to the dragonflies that tend to be more stout and round. And the damselflies that you'll find in main streams, uh, the most common ones are these jewel wings. And um, they, these jewel wings uh, have their bodies, this picture is, doesn't do justice. It's like an iridescent green or iridescent blue, depending on what color you're looking at it. And it's, it's gorgeous, beautiful dragonfly or damselfly. And uh, the females have this white dot at the tip of the wing and the males uh, have just a solid dark wing. There are a couple other kinds. This is called an ebony jewel wing. There are a couple other kinds of jewel wings that will have a, like a gold colored body. Um, and there's one that has a, a green body, but the wings aren't as dark. It's, a, it's, it's half dark and half light. In um, any case, the jewel wings have the, you, for the basic key, you would just need to recognize that it's a damselfly. If you were doing the advanced key, then you, you might, uh, you might be able to go look at what kind of damselfly. Uh, and the, the jewel wings have these uh, antennae in, on their heads that are stiff and project out like bullhorns. And uh, you can also find these narrow winged damselflies that tend to be smaller, shorter in uh, some uh, rocky and root type habitats. Uh, these spread, spread winged damselflies uh, these are typically more pond and wetland related, but if you are sampling uh, the edge of a stream where there's vegetation or roots, you might collect some of them in your sample too. And uh, so these guys are also predators. They eat other aquatic insects for the most part. And you might notice a pattern where the types of a macroinvertebrates or aquatic insects you're finding are generally the babies. And they, they typically have a, adult forms that fly around in air. The next group are mayflies. And mayflies, uh, if you're a trout freshman, you'll know all about mayflies because of uh, the, uh, the, the artificial lures that are used to replicate their hatches and stuff like that. And again, uh, this, you can tell it's a group one. Uh, you ha it has these segmented legs, 
and uh, being an aquatic insect, it has six legs. And there's some wing pads on the back. So there's one wing pad, and there's another wing pad. And uh, mayflies, uh, as far as I know, I said usually one pair, because I just didn't know if there was an oddball somewhere, but all the wing pads I know of in all the mayflies I know of in Maine and the United States have one pair of wing pads, as opposed to many of the other aquatic insects, larvae and naiads that ha um, would have uh, two pairs. And uh, mayflies, the way you would distinguish it from a damselfly is the gills. So the damselfly um, has the, looks like three tails. From above, they look like they're thin, but from the side, they're, they're paddle shaped. In contrast, the uh, mayflies' tails are, are just thin, like a very, just a, um, and here's another tail. So they're just more like a filament. And uh, these guys need to breathe also, and they have gills on their abdomen. So uh, most aquatic insects, larvae have nine abdominal segments. So if you started here at the back where the tail, there's, uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And if you were, um, if you were a real taxonomist, you would really pay attention to what abdominal segments have gills and which don't. Um, in this case, for the basic guide, um, you just want to look to see if there are any gills on the abdomen. And, and, and that in combination with the, uh, the legs, the general body shape will get you to mayfly. Uh, mayflies have a, an interesting life cycle where the adults will lay eggs, the eggs will hatch, and you'll have the, the naiad or nymph, and then it will emerge into an infertile stage called a dun that will fly around and will molt a second time into the adult fertile adult which will then uh, mate and lay eggs. And um, these have these, some species have these amazing hatches where they, they synchronize, where uh, the, all the mayflies or many of the mayflies of the same species will know um, by certain environmental cues to that it's this night we're gonna go out and we're going to emerge and, and have these um, uh, tremendous hatches. And uh, some of the mayflies will be an adult for just one day. And then they don't have any mouth parts or anything. They don't eat, they just uh, reproduce and die. And then some uh, mayflies will live for a little bit longer as an adult, but they primarily spend their life in the water. Hey Tom, um, Sally's asking, how long is it between the done and the adult stage? Uh, I think it's just a matter of hours. So I think they, uh, they'll go to a nymph to done and then to quickly, relatively quickly to the adult spinner stage. And uh, so in the stream explorers, I went through, looked at um, the, what were the most common mayflies in our streams and rivers in Maine. And uh, they have these groups, you have uh, flat-headed, brush-legged, small square gill, small minnow, spiny crawler, and prong gilled. And um, some of these can be quite small, especially when they're young. So they'll, they'll be as small as a grain of rice. And, and so when you have this tray of water um, and sediment and leaves, um, you, you'll really have to just kind of uh, get used to just staring at it and seeing, looking for movement. And the more you look, the more you see. So it's, it's really fun. And uh, one of the behaviors that may mayfly naiads have is that when they move around, uh, some of them will swim and they'll swim up and down uh, like, a, like a whale or dolphin, as opposed to other um, types of in aquatic insects that typically go side to side like a fish or lizard. Um, so 
with a small minnow, uh, flathead, um, the brush legged, those guys are really strong swimmers. Some of them don't swim that much, they will, but they, they generally don't like the spiny crawler, they kind of just crawl around. And uh, some of these are adapted to live on uh, rocks, in particular, like the flat headed mayflies, their whole body is compressed. So when they are in the fast water on a rock, they're, they keep a low profile, so the water just flows right over them. And uh, some of them, uh, you know, are like the prong guild are a little bit more bulky. And uh, these guys tend to show up in a little bit more of the sandier sections or areas where there's wood, that sort of stuff. So in, in uh, just a quick reminder, the mayflies, you're looking at the segmented legs, gills on the abdomen, and the older ones will have one pair of wing pads. They usually have three tails. Some, there are two kinds of mayflies you can find in Maine that have only two tails. So here's one that only has two tails. And one of the small minnow mayflies only has two tails. Um, you can see on the bodies that there's a variety of different types of gills. And uh, you it's hard to see on the, this screen because it's small. But if you look in the guidebook, you'll, it'll be clear. And so uh, there's these uh, paddle shaped gills here. They're, this guy looks like he has punk hairdo with these gills that kind of stick right out. Um, uh, these are prong gilled, so they they can have um, they split in different ways. Some of them will have like a leaf shape with prongs coming off of it, and some of them, like the square gill and the spiny crawlers, is really apparent where the square gill, where uh, they will have protective covers over the gills, and so they're called gill plates, and they're thought to help protect the gills from. Uh, bits of sand or silt floating in the water. And um, so those are pretty obvious. And uh, the spiny crawlers tend to have these, like the gill plates are, are smaller. And uh, once they might be hard to recognize at first, but if you look in the guide, the pictures are will be a lot better. And um, uh, you'll get used to looking for that. All right. So in comparison, the most likely things you're going to get mayflies confused with are the damselflies and the next group, which are the stoneflies. Um, stoneflies are probably, as a group, the most sensitive aquatic macroinvertebrates in Maine. As a group, they need really cold, oxygen-rich, clean water. Um, and they uh, look a fair bit like mayflies, but the key diagnostic features are, well, we'll, we'll first of all, they, to get them in that group one, they have a clear head, they have jointed legs, so they have six legs, um, and they have wing pads. So um, on this guy here, that thoracic segment one, this is thoracic segment two, thoracic segment three. So on thoracic segment one, there would never be any wing pads. On an older stonefly naiad, you can see that this shape is different than that one. And that's these little triangular things are called, they, they're not as obvious as some of the other wing pads, but those are the wing pads developing. And uh, so they have the wing pads on segments two and three, where the mayflies, I think only just have it on segment two and not on three. Um, stoneflies uh, only have two tails. They'll never have three tails. Stoneflies, most of them don't have any gills at, on the abdomen. The, there's one or two uh, exceptions where uh, just up near like the armpits, they might have a little bit of hairy gills. And so this is a common stonefly. And um, you can see this kind of yellowish, uh, hairy stuff in the armpits and or leg pits. And uh, those are the gills. 
but they don't have like those paddle shaped gills or prong gills or 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 any kind of uh, covers protecting gills on the abdomen. And in uh, main streams, these are the ones you're most likely to find doing this type of stream explorer survey. Um, in addition to the common stoneflies, this one, you can also have a rolled winged winter, roach-like, slender winter, nemurid, and giant. The, again, some of these things are tiny. So the uh, rolled winged in winter, they're like a grain of rice crawling around. Um, and if they're in their wing pads can be quite small and um, they'll be uh, parallel to the body. So if you're doing like an advanced key, you would pay attention to uh, where the wing pads are, what the shape, what the shapes of the wing pads are, uh, is and then um, so for example this this one here the wing pads are a different shape than than this one here and any case again there's a variety of shapes a variety of sizes the largest ones you're going to find will be the giant I'm sorry the common stoneflies they often have this like tiger shape these guys are predators and so so they all go around in search of food. Uh, they'll typically other other aquatic uh, macroinvertebrates. Um, some of these uh, other um, stoneflies are vegetarian, and they'll eat. Uh, they they'll shred leaves, and they won't necessarily eat the leaves, but they'll shred the leaves and eat the bacteria and fungi and everything that's growing on the leaves. And uh, these guys need cold, clean water. So uh, some of these are specialized for, for um, completing their life cycle in the winter. And so for some of these uh, stoneflies, the summer is the most stressful time of year because the water gets warm and warm water holds less oxygen. And so uh, some of them will burrow down into the ground and they'll spend the, the summer underground where the water there's water and it's colder. Some of them will um, will spend the summer as an egg and they will hatch in the fall. And um, the giant stoneflies are some of my favorite. Those I associate with the, the nicest of the streams in, in Maine. And um, they're kind of spiky and this, this picture here doesn't really give it justice. Often they'll have the more of a spiky appearance on the, the each of the abdominal segments and on the thoracic segments. And uh, they'll curl up in a little ball. And so if you see a large, dark, spiky thing that curls into a ball, then think of, oh, maybe I got a giant stonefly. Um, so Tom, sorry to interrupt, but when you yeah. say giant, how big are we talking about? Yeah, so um, that's a great term. This is all in perspective of uh, size of macroinvertebrates. So um, you have things that, like the uh, rolled winged and slender, slender winter that will be the size of like a grain of rice. And the uh, giant stonefly might be up to like an inch or inch and a half, but to, compared to the other ones, he's giant. <laughs> Uh, actually, I take that back. Giant stoneflies can get bigger, maybe like two, maybe two and a half inches. And then the same with the uh, common stonefly. Some of these guys can get quite large. And, and um, uh, while you're uh, doing the sampling where you are rubbing the rocks and things are floating into the net, uh, keep an eye out for the giant, these common stoneflies in particular. They are strong and they don't care about the water flowing fast, they'll just, they'll be tempted to crawl out of the net. <laughs> so um, just keep an eye out for them while, while you're doing that work, you might need to gently shove them back in. Um, all right, so any other questions about the group one? So again, the group ones have segmented legs and the older larvae have these wing pads. They have incomplete metamorphosis their bodies, uh, that means that they do not make a pupa. They just crawl out of the water and will 
more one last time out of the water, pump up the wings, fly away. Their bodies are generally um, armored. They're not, they're not squishy and soft. Um, it, so Hannah, are there any other questions for this group? Yes, yeah, we have one about the mayfly. So um, how long from egg laying to nymph for the mayfly? Uh, whew. Uh, I think it really depends on the species. Uh, some of them, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that some of them, uh, like the small minnow mayflies, these some, some species in that group can have more than one generation in a year, I'm pretty sure. And others, um, uh, some of these other ones, they only have one generation. So they'll, they'll only mo come out of the water once every spring or once every summer, depending on their timing for that species. Um, and I don't know if they delay hatching. Some of these, again, uh, the summer is the most stressful time of year because the water is warm uh, for some of these critters. And um, so they might delay the, the when the eggs hatch to see when the water starts to cool again. And then some of them might just have a quick hatch pretty quickly because they're vulnerable just sitting there as an egg. How's that for a wishy-washy answer? <laughs> Well, it just means, yeah, we'll, we'll look into that a little bit more, Beth, <laughs> and, and hopefully give a, a, you know, a clear answer. Um, and then I want to ask this because I feel like it gets asked every year and I want to um, get it out there now because when you're dealing with things like your giant two and a half inch um, stoneflies and then you got to push it back into the net, are we worried at all about um, can they bite or can they sting? Um, while I'm going through, I'll mention which ones you might want to worry about. Um, so far, uh, I wouldn't be worried about any of these things. And it'd be more just uh, us being gentle with them to make sure that when we're done, they can get back into the water and continue their fruitful life. Especially if you're wanting to try and, and poke the dragonfly. Please be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, dragonflies are chill. They're good. Um, so uh, one other thing I just want to mention, uh, uh, when you're looking in the pan, uh, dragonflies will generally crawl around or will use that jet propulsion movement. The uh, damselflies will, will do a crawl around, and if they do swim, it will be like a side-to-side -side slow movement. The uh, mayflies um, will have this up and down like a dolphin. And or they'll be quite quick. So if you see something darting across the pan, think mayfly. Uh, stoneflies uh, tend to crawl and they, they do this side to side like a lizard type of movement. Um, just some tips on the behavior that you, to help get you in the right direction. All right, so the next group have a clearly defined head. Uh, they have a thorax with six segmented legs. And uh, these tend to have a squishy body. And they never have wing pads. And these, all these insects go through a complete metamorphosis like a monarch butterfly, where you have an adult that lays eggs either uh, in the water or over the water. Often the eggs are laid on a rock or a plant uh, right on the edge of the water or over the water. So when the eggs hatch, the larvae will go into the water. And then uh, they have uh, uh, the larval stage. And then they pupate typically in the water. And then they'll come out and emerge as an adult. And uh, this here is a Glossosoma, it's a type of caddisfly. And we'll, we'll start with the caddisflies first. So caddisflies, um, again, you have these, you know they're in the, this group because they have these uh, segmented legs. They have a head, a, a thorax, 
with one, two, three segments. Each segment has a pair of legs for a total of six legs. There's an a, abdomen. Typically it's nine abdominal segments. So if you count it up, it'd be nine. Um, they have a squishy body and they look a little bit like a caterpillar. They are closely related to moths and butterflies. And you can find um, it, it, this summer and spring, when you have your porch light on, you know, in the evening, go out and you'll, you'll most likely find caddisflies around your porch light. And so look for something that looks like a moth, except uh, where a moth will hold its wings flat. The caddisflies, their wings are like tented. And also, um, I don't know, like here, they're, it's like tented. It's a little, it from, if you look at it in the right direction, it'll be like, like that. And the wings, uh, instead of having scales like a moth or a butterfly, they have scaly wings. And their scientific name is Trichoptera, so hairy wing. And uh, on the rear end, most caddisfly larvae I can think of have these two claws on the rear end. And some of them have gills, but they won't look like the gills on a mayfly or a damselfly. They'll just be like these like hair, thick hairs on their body. And whoops. So there's a couple different types of uh, caddisflies. There's uh, one, uh, the caddisfly larvae, since they're related to moths and butterflies, they can spin silk. And so using that silk, some of them will assemble these mobile homes called cases. And these uh, cases can, depending on the species and where it lives and what materials are available, uh, they'll, be, they'll assemble these cases out of uh, rocks and sand or pieces, pieces of um, sedges and rushes and grasses or pieces of leaves or um, hemlock needles and uh, bark. And um, if you were doing, the more you learn about these, the, the advanced keys and the ones that use by professionals and everything can get into, you can identify the critters based on the shape of the cases and some, for some of them. Um, in this case, for the basic uh, stream explorers, we're just trying to say that it's a caddisfly and it has a case. And so you just want to be aware that these things are designed uh, to be well camouflaged. And so um, you'll be, you have to look for them. And so again, one of the one strategy you can do is just get stuff in the pan and just spend a minute or two just looking in the pan for movement. And then you'll start seeing things moving around. You're like, wait, that's a bug? No way. And then, and then uh, you'll find these uh, different shaped uh, cases. Some of them are very tiny. So I, um, some of them will be just like a couple hemlock needles that are uh, put together with the silk and are moving around. <laughs> um, some of them will be look like a little snail, but made out of uh, of uh, these fine sand. So uh, patience and be very observant. And then uh, sometimes you can also uh, take a spoon and just gently swirl the contents in the, the pan and look for things that aren't moving. And so that's another way, if there's something moving um, in the opposite direction of the swirling water or something that's just not moving at all. And you can pay attention to those items that might be like a caddisfly that's, you know, um, really grabbed onto the plastic tray, or it might be a mayfly that's swimming uh, in opposite direction of the flowing water. Any case, again, you're just looking for these fleshy bodied critters with legs. Um, and as these guys get bigger, they will abandon their home and build a new case, that sort of thing. So if you, uh, some of these guys when you collect them and they're in their pan, certain species will, will be very reluctant to leave their homes and others will be 
very quick to leave their homes. So you might find them in the home or you might find them just uh, crawling around the tray outside of the home. And um, it's not the end of the world that they're without a home. These guys are pros, they'll, they'll build themselves a new home quickly. So uh, another group of caddisflies are those that make uh, underwater nets using their silk. And uh, they uh, have a very similar body shape they, as the other caddisflies. They have uh, a head, three thoracic segments with six legs. They have a soft, squishy abdomen, uh, two hooks on the rear end. And here's two hooks on the rear end there. Um, but instead of using the silk to cement together a mobile home, they'll make underwater nets. And so here's um, this one here is uh, a common net spinner. And so here's a common net spinner in its silken home. And so you can really see this like a spider web or a fishing net. And so they designed these nets so the water flows and carries little bits of, of algae or plant parts or even little invertebrates that will get caught in the net. And so they're just uh, sitting there and munching uh, and repairing their net and then munching some more on stuff and then repairing their net and, and they'll spend their life doing that. Um, another group are these uh, Dobson flies and alder flies. The Dobson flies can get uh, they'll start off very small, but they can grow to be quite large. So they could be as large as your finger. As, and these, uh, some of the large uh, Dobson fly larvae can live in the water for several years, like three years before deciding to be an adult. And so they are somewhat tolerant of, they're in a somewhat tolerant category. They, they are a little bit, um, they're not as sensitive to pollution as the stoneflies, for example, but is also a very good sign to find daubs and flies in a stream because it just means that the, those, the quality of the water has been good and there's been, these are also predators, so there's, there's good food source and the water is good and the habitat's good for a number of years. So that's a, a good thing to find. The adults uh, um, are quite large. Um, they can be like three to four inches long, depending on the species. They have uh, big, long, big wings, and the adult males have these elaborate tusks on them. And they are, they are not, won't harm you at all. They just make them look muy macho, I guess, to the female um, dobs and flies. Another term for dobs and flies is a uh, helgramite. Um, and uh, the, the, I have known of one person who got nipped by a larval Dobson fly. Um, it was a big one and it was more defending itself type of thing. So you could just be careful with them. But these guys are uh, giant predators. Uh, they, they go around and if you were a tiny macroinvertebrate, uh, this would be a scary thing coming at you. The alder flies uh, um, are smaller relatives of the Dobs Dobson flies. They tend to be like a half inch to an inch in size. And they are typically found in, in muddy, sandy type of habitat more often than the dobs of flies and more of the uh, rocky and woody type of habitat. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause here and see if there's any questions about this group. We just had the, a, a comment about the dobs and flies being biters. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they, oh. you, can, you can see the big chompers on the yeah. larvae. The adults are, they're chill, but they, these guys, they can bite. Although I, uh, I've handled them many times without being bit, but, uh, uh, see, but being uh, careful is probably the best uh, approach. <laughs> and we do include, so in the kits, there's, there's brushes and sp uh, spoons and little droppers and tweezers. So there's a lot of tools in there that you can use. Um, so you don't, aren't having to put your hands in there. Yes, and in fact, uh, for the for most of the um, macroinvertebrates, when you're getting them out of the tray, I highly recommend that you don't use your hands; that you use the brushes and spoons, primarily to, for the safety of the critters. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, 
and it, and especially if you and what about um, Tom if you what you should, what should you do with your hands before if you do have to put your hands in there um, what do you want to make sure is not on your hands yeah so um, it's probably best when you are handling um, the the equipment or if you're when you're sorting that you don't have uh, like avoid putting on hand cream or um, even hand sanitizer. If you do have that sort of stuff on, then uh, try to wash it off uh, well before you start, um, you know, working with the critters. I don't know if those things would harm the critters, but um, I, it's, it's a nice precautionary step to make sure that the, we don't harm them. Yeah, or, or put it back into the stream. So yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a great point. Um, and that is, we don't have any other questions for this for this section. Okay. Um, so the next group are these critters that uh, have, uh, sometimes you can see the head, sometimes you can't. They'll have a soft fleshy body and no legs. They, 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 they don't have the jointed legs like what we've seen earlier. They may have these little bumpy things called pro legs and they don't have wing pads. And so these critters uh, go through a complete metamorphosis. And so they'll have the adult, uh, the egg, the larva, the pupa, and then the adult. And, um, and the larva, the larvae look very different than the adults. So the most abundant um, types of uh, insects in this group are what are called true flies. And so these have um, like midge larvae, crane flies, and black flies. And so uh, midges, um, this is very enlarged picture. So I don't know if you all have been at a out in the evening around your yard or a baseball field or a pond and there'll be this little um, cloud of these little insects just flying around minding their own business and those are the non-biting uh, midges and so uh, the larvae live in water and they have uh, they have they'll usually be white or cream colored and some of them are red colored and they'll have um, a head, very small head capsule. They'll have little bumpies, pro legs here. And uh, sometimes on the, the rear end, they'll have some little pro legs. Otherwise, they they're just look like a grub. And uh, these are tiny. So in the pan, you're looking for something that's the size of a grain of rice, short grain rice, or even smaller. And um, they will sometimes wriggle in the pan a little bit. And some of them are, will be a little bit longer, um, up to like a half inch. And uh, the ones that are red are really amazing because they have hemoglobin. And so I, I just, when I found that out the first time, I, I just thought it was very interesting that uh, the hemoglobin that we have in our blood to help get oxygen, uh, these guys have in their bodies to help get oxygen from the water in environments where there may not be a lot of the oxygen. So uh, in the bottom sediment of a, in a pond or in a stream, something like that. Um, so uh, midges in particular will go through, some of them can go through multiple generations a year um, and they can recolonize quickly. Uh, in general, they tend to be somewhat tolerant. And then the ones that are red, they can survive uh, in oxygen poor environments and are more tolerant. Uh, crane flies uh, can range in size from like an inch to three inches. And these uh, eat, um, crane flies generally eat uh, leaves and vegetation. And again, often they're not eating the leaves of vegetation for the sake of the, they're not going after that as the food, they're going after the, the film of like the sli little slimy film of bacteria and fungi and other little organisms growing on the, the leaves. The adults crane flies um, look like giant mosquitoes. So if you 
are ever going around and you see this like giant mosquito thing with very long legs flying around. It's a crane fly and they're peaceful vegetarians. So don't, they won't bother you at all. And the, the, lar the larvae um, for the most part are uh, eat the leaves. Um, midges, uh, they eat a variety of things. Mostly they'll eat the decaying organic matter. There are a couple of types of midges that are predators. Um, and then the other group in here, people are probably more familiar with than they'd like to be are the black flies. And so we all know what the black fly adults look like. And the uh, larvae have this interesting body shape where they on their rear end, they'll have a suction cup um, that will like a disc with little spines and it, and it will, they'll be able to hang on to a rock or a plant and then they have these modified mouth parts that they, they, they stick out and they uh, will filter feed. So they sit there um, moving their head around and they gather little bits of decaying organic matter or little algae or little tiny zooplankton and they'll, they'll eat that. Um, so one of the neat things about black flies is that uh, while they're sitting there, if they see a predator coming toward them, they have a, a safety mechanism a behavior where they will release themselves from the substrate that they're on and they'll float downstream, but they'll leave a, a silken like bungee cord. And so they later when it's safe, they can uh, use their mouth to you know, basically wind themselves back into where uh, they can attach to a surface again. Uh, so again, uh, these guys uh, have a, a head capsule that you can see, but no legs, no wing pads, no observable gills. Um, crane flies, the head capsule sometimes is inside their body, but you're distinguishing it that it, it looks like a big grub, no segmented legs, no uh, filaments or gills on the rear end, no wing pads. Um, so these true flies are all in that group. And if you're doing the advanced uh, version of the key, there's a few other types of, um, of aquatic insects that I'm not covering right now. But uh, any questions so far about this group? Not yet. I okay. think, yeah, people are pretty, pretty familiar with, with the black fly. Yeah. Okay. So the, the final group are uh, insects that you would find as adults. And uh, so uh, the first group are beetles. And uh, the beetles are tricky because uh, you can find the beetles as a larval stage or as the adult stage. And so uh, depending on what type of beetle it is. So in this case, we have a uh, riffle beetle. And um, this guy has, uh, goes through complete metamorphosis. So you have the adult that goes, then would have an egg, then a larva, and then a pupate, and then an adult. And uh, so these, these guys have segmented legs and their bodies are not squishy. They're, they tend to have a little bit of um, a firmer exoskeleton. And uh, these uh, larvae um, would fall into the, the group two, but if you found the adult, uh, they would look like these. So you have the adult uh, riffle beetles are tiny. They can be the size of a poppy seed with legs to like a, a grain of rice with legs. And um, uh, as an adult, they need to, to breathe and get oxygen just like uh, we do. So the adult beetles have certain adaptations basically to carry a, uh, an air bubble underwater with them. So um, on the, the air bubble will either be a very thin layer uh, on their belly or underneath their wings or on their rear end depending on what kind of beetle it is. And if the water is cold enough and there's enough oxygen in the water, then the oxygen will 
just replenish from the water to the bubble. And so, so basically the, these guys have a scuba tank that they carry around with them underwater and either it will replenish itself with oxygen just by having new oxygen come from the water into the air bubble, or some of them, like the whirligig beetle and some of these diving beetles, you'll be able to watch them and they'll, they'll swim up to the surface and get some fresh air and then swim back down. But all of these beetles have, um, as a larvae, have six legs, uh, no wing pads, uh, these goes through the complete metamorphosis. And, um, and then the adults all have that classic beetle shape. They often, uh, will, if the ones that crawl around, like the riffle beetles, these guys just crawl around on rocks in, in, in logs and stuff like that. So they have uh, nice legs for helping to hold on and very pronounced uh, claws for hanging on. And then the, there's another other ones that are more swimmers. And so they're uh, legs are flattened or have, and sometimes will have hairs to help them uh, scurry around or swim around very quickly. Some of them, like the diving beetles, will spend most of their time underwater and will only come up to the surface to replenish their air bubble. Uh, some of them, like the whirligig beetle, as an adult, will spend their basic most of their life just on the, the surface of the water and they'll just go around in circles. And some of them are large and some of them are small. And uh, they have uh, um, nice paddle shaped uh, legs to help swim. Uh, the whirligig beetles are cool uh, because they spend their life at the water air interface, their eyes, their compound eyes are split. So they have a set of eyes that look up into the air and then a set of eyes that look down into the water so they can see all around them at the same time to look for food items and also to avoid being caught by predators. Um, if you handle a whirligig beetle adult, sometimes they'll have like a little cherry smell. I, I don't know if that's like a defensive mechanism, that, um, but it just smells a little bit like cherries. Um, so, I guess basically the rule of thumb is if you have a critter that's large and you can see that it has big chomping mouth parts, then be careful of them. Um, the other, other ones you don't, you don't have to be so worried about. Um, one other critter that you might wanna be careful with that I don't have a picture here is a back swimmer. And I wonder if I have, yeah, I think there's a picture of back swimmer here. So back swimmers um, swim uh, in the water. They're related to water boatmen. Uh, they are in a group, they are typically found in lakes and, and in uh, ponds, that type of environment. So they're not in the stream explorer program. You might come across them if you are sampling the like edge of a slow moving stream. But these guys are called back swimmers because they swim around upside down and uh, they have a mouth part on the, their, on the other side, you can't see it, but they have a straw-like mouth part where if they went around and caught a prey item, they would poke that mouth part into the prey, inject a digestive juice, and then suck out the, the goodies. And um, if they can nip you. So of all the critters, um, this is the one here I would be careful of avoid handling with your hands. Um, it just feels like a like a honeybee sting, but it's something you're good to avoid. Um, so again, there's lots of different macroinvertebrates. Uh, I think I should back up and show some of the other ones that I focused on the insects. Uh, but in general, if you had a healthy stream, you would get a, a large diversity or wide diversity of macroinvertebrates. There's a lot of different habitat niches and habitat complexity. And so with the blue ones, you have some of these sensitive organisms and you have some greens where are, are more moderately sensitive. You can have the tolerant ones too, that's perfectly normal. And is just when you have a uh, predominance of the predominant of, of the tolerant organisms and no sensitives, that would be a, more of an altered stream. Um, so, some low gradient 
what I mean by low gradient is uh, so some streams that are in the coastal plain, like down near the ocean, like around Portland or Falmouth, that kind of area. Some of them uh, where the, the slope of the stream is not very steep. It's more of like a um, slow moving sandy or mucky stream. You could have a hard time finding some of these sensitive organisms in those streams just because of the habitat. So um, don't get very discouraged if you if you are sampling one of those sandier, especially muckier streams, it, and it, and you aren't finding a lot of these sensitive organisms, it could be just the habitat. Um, I'm going to back up quickly to mention some of the other things that were not insects. Uh, so these are all insects, insects. All right, so uh, here's another critter that I didn't mention is a water penny. And a water penny is a baby beetle larva that is, it, it, and it's uh, flattened. It looks like in a, like an ocean, there's a, a critter called a limpet. That's a kind of snail. And um, there's also freshwater limpets too. Uh, but the water penny, um, it is a beetle larva, and, and this is one where if you have stuff in your tray, like some sand and water, if you slowly kind of swirl the water a little bit, you might find the water penny like just hanging on to the tray. And another way to find water pennies would be to uh, pick up any sort of um, like branch or leaf that's in the pan and just examine it. Uh, some of these uh, insects are really adapted to hang on to something. And so uh, given the chance, they'll, they'll, they'll grab onto whatever they can. And so they'll grab onto uh, a leaf or a piece of wood or even another critter. So in the pan, you'll sometimes find like a snail with a, a mayfly on its back. Uh, Another uh, thing you could look for are crayfish. They look like little lobsters, but they're freshwater. And they uh, can range in size from being you know, very teeny tiny when they're very young to being several inches long as an adult. And the crayfish, uh, to distinguish them from insects, the crayfish have 10 legs. Um, you have limpets, which are a type of snail that are flattened and uh, have that sort of, the ones we find in Maine are, are that kind of shape like a, like a bean almost. And um, they'll be a little bit pyramided in shape where they'll be, uh, they'll be flush against the rock or leaf or, or twig, but then uh, they'll get taller in the center. Uh, you can also find snails and amphipods. Uh, so these are also sometimes called uh, side swimmers or scuds. Um, isopods. Uh, these in are related to sow bugs that you can find on land. Uh, leeches. So you can find some leeches in main uh, streams and rivers. In general, they'll never bother you. Uh, so just you can just use the spoons and the brushes to help get them out of the pans. Uh, there's aquatic worms. The aquatic worms uh, are related to earthworms, but in their body shape is generally a lot uh, thinner and they tend to be uh, gray to white pink. Uh, they're very, they, so if you see something that looks like an earthworm, but it's very uh, thin and their bodies tend to be very delicate. So you can be careful handling them, they sometimes will break apart. Um, yeah, so those are the, the non-insect macroinvertebrates that you'd be looking for with the stream explorers. And um, so that's the rest I have there, and I'd be happy to answer any remaining questions. So if you do have questions, you have a couple options. You're welcome to put it in the Q&A. Um, you're also welcome if you want to raise your hand on Zoom and I can allow you to talk if you would like um, to ask your question that way as well. Um, and while we wait to see if any questions come in, 
I just want to talk about kind of what the next steps would be um, if uh, you want to get out there and sample. So I will be sending out an email to everybody, and that's going to have links to all of the materials that you'll need. Um, I know there's a lot of critters, and right now it might be a little bit overwhelming, um, but between the wonderful materials that Tom has created, the um, optional in-person workshops, and then our support throughout the sampling season, um, folks really are, are able to get in there and, and start identifying. So, um, and I think that people kind of get hooked after the first time. So you may, may struggle a little bit at the, at the beginning um, or have a few more questions and that's great. We welcome any questions, any photos. Um, and then as you start going um, and getting, getting more into the treasure hunt, you're gonna be able to start noticing more and more things. Um, so I will send out an email with all of that information as well as a sign-up sheet for the in-person workshops. Um, I know I've heard from a few of you already and I'll be getting back um, to you about sites and about partners. Um, so in the next, um, you know, in the next week or so, we'll, we'll help to get everything organized. Um, so we've got a couple questions coming in. Um, um, so let's see here, is the entire state in one uh, zoographic region or are there north-south differences? Um. It's pretty much the statewide, you'll find the same critters. Um, you might, they, in areas, if you're working in uh, like the county, up in Aristic County, where there's more limestone in the geology, you can actually, they, 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 those streams tend to have a greater diversity of aquatic insects compared to uh, some of the like more acidic mountainous nutrient poor streams like up in the like to the west western southwestern part of the state so um that you'll find the same critters statewide i tried to pick select critters uh that would be statewide um but it's more dependent on where the stream is in the landscape that you might see differences and that could be something that uh you could try out. You, if you're curious, you could try sampling a small stream and going and sampling a, a little bit larger, like small river, and you might notice that there, there's differences. Uh, we have a couple questions about um, just about workshops and things. So um, at the in-person workshops, will we be doing sampling? And yes, yes. So that um, each one will have one in Falmouth, one in Bridgeton, and one in Holden. Um, we will be able to and some of them will have the um, will have kind of buckets of waters and buckets of critters that have been collected, and then they'll be put out in the bins, and you'll be able to actually you know start searching for them. In the Falmouth one, we're going to be doing at, at at a local site where you'll actually be able to get in the water and practice sampling. And then the one is in Holden is at our Fields Pond location, so you'll also be able to get in the water there um, to actually practice sampling. Um, and then we'll have representatives from our different partners there to help walk through the key and to use the guide um, and really show you how those things work together. Um, I really, really recommend that folks, if you get a chance, go to one of these in-person workshops. It's so much better than what I just did. <laughs> and it will give you the opportunity to really uh, look at them and start, it, you'll, it, it's this eye-opening experience where it's like, it's a whole world that opens up to you. It's really fun. Yeah, it is. It is one thing to kind of talk about it um, and to be like, oh, no, like I, I wouldn't be able to see that it's too small. And then when you start to look in, in there, you really can. It's pretty cool. Um, Chris is asking if it's OK to start with the advanced key. And then if it, it looks like it's going to be a little bit too difficult, can you go back to the simpler one? Um, I would say absolutely. Um, sure. Yeah, I think, you know, which, whichever you're more comfortable with, um, go for it. I don't know if you have any other answer there, Tom. Uh, no, um, um, and I'm, uh, don't be bashful about taking pictures with your, your camera phone and sending them to me. I, I, I'm happy to help um, if you're not sure what something is. I might not be able to get it right back to you right away, but I could get back to you eventually. I'm busy in the summer fish, uh, doing sampling and stuff. But And I think, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but your email address is also on that um, form, right? That, that data form that we're looking yeah. at right now. Yeah, I, I think I took it off 
I cropped it off of this, but on the on the paper form, it's on there, and also on the guidebook. Um, and if you are not getting emails yet, so when you registered for this webinar, I now have your email address, and so that is the list I'll be using um, in addition to our to um, some past lists. So um, if you have not received any emails about the in-person workshops or anything, don't worry, they haven't been sent out yet. Um, and I will be using this email address, um, the email address that you registered with. If for any reason you want it sent to a different email address, um, I am putting my email address in the chat right now. Just please shoot me a quick email um, and I can make sure to update that whichever way you would like to be contacted. Um, and we have another question about, oh, about rainstorms. So we have some nice summer rainstorms in Maine. Um, should we sample after a rainstorm or should we wait a day or two? Um, it's mostly uh, just the we, more safety for, the, for us in that case. We don't, you don't wanna get into water that's moving really quickly where you might, if you don't feel safe doing that. And also, um, it might be, um, if the water is flowing really fast, it might be a little harder to, you know, to collect the samples. Um, otherwise, the critters are still going to be there. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's see. Are there any other questions? Um, this is a, remember, this is a kind of all, all summer into early fall thing. So you have um, between you know now and October, if you'd like to get out there, um, let's see here. And we have see it says at the bottom of the key, what does the word? Um, so we have the the least wanted, moderately wanted. Um, I think she's let's see here, referring to at the bottom down there. So it says sensitive, moderately wanted, and least sensitive. Oh, so can you just go over that again? The, the uh, three categories. Yeah, I have to apologize. I think uh, this is a very old um, slide. And uh, so that was a previous terminology we, we were messing around with, and, but we were using sensitive, um, we're using sensitive, moderately sensitive and tolerant. And so uh, that's, that's a mistake down there because all the critters are wanted. <laughs> Um, and Chris is asking, so, so I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but um, if we go out twice, is it better to do one stream twice or two different streams? Um, and, and I think we kind of said it, it's, it's up to you. So both things are going to be really interesting, right? A comparison between one stream uh, twice or seeing what's in two different streams. Tom, do you have a, a thought on is one better than the other? Um, no, I think it's personal choice, just whatever you think would be most exciting for your, for your um, learning. Um, we have a question about the kits. So how do we check out the equipment and how long can we keep it? Um, so in the email that I send out to everyone will be a link to um, a document that has all of the site locations where you can check out a kit as well as the contact information for the person um, that you would reach out to to do that. Um, Generally, we would ask that you not keep the kit for more than a week or so. If there is not someone you know, in line after you and you wanna keep it for a little longer, please feel free to reach out to that contact and say, hey, I, I wanna sample again, or there was a big rainstorm and I wasn't able to get out. Can I hold on to it for a little longer? Um, a lot of times, you know, that will be fine. Um, but there are a couple of times you know, during the season where it may be a little bit busier. So we might ask, um, you know, if, if you aren't able to get out, maybe to return it so the next person can do it and then you could check it out again. But again, I will provide all that information in terms of, of where you can check out a kit um, and who to contact uh, via email. And then we'll also have that on our website as well. Um, Hannah, yes. uh, earlier I saw that uh, Jack Walonda had his yes. email. Yes, I saw that too, and it's not up anymore. Would you still like to be able to talk? And I and I'm assuming it's it's um, Jacques. I'm sorry if if I did not pronounce it correctly. Um, 
but perhaps your question has been answered, but if you do still have a question, please raise your hand and I can get you um, unmuted again. We might be okay, maybe, maybe, maybe the question was answered. Um, but we do know, we do expect there to be more questions after this, um, whether it be about the actual, you know, the macroinvertebrates themselves or logistics or sites. Um, so please feel free to reach out at any time to that conserve at mainaudubon.org email. Um, and we're just, you know, really starting to, we'll be starting to gear up. And Tom, I'm gonna get you to stop sharing your screen for just a second. I'll do that for you. There you go. <laughs> um, and so, yes, again, we expect questions. So please, please send them through. Um, I will be, these will be, the recordings will be available. So please look for an email um, early next week. I will send that out with all of the information that we've gone over um, and various links and things. Um, and then if you have any questions about that, you can always, always reply back. Um, and that being said, I think we're, we're, Look at that, like really well on time. <laughs> um, Tom, I wanna to thank you again so much. We are so lucky <laughs> to have your expertise with this and um, it's wonderful. Your enthusiasm for these critters is great and um, contagious. So we appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you all for attending. We're really excited again for this year three of Stream Explorers. Um, and excited to see what, what critters you find and what streams you go to. Um, and I look forward to talking with you all over the season um, and getting to know you a little bit better. So thank you again. Thank you, Tom. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>